this question that you see on the screen today, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen, is a question of vital importance for you in your daily walk as a Christian. How great is God to you? How great is God in reality? How great is God to someone like John the Baptist? How great is God to those who don't believe in him? How great is God to those who look at him as a philosophy or a, a picture or an icon? Everyone has a, an image in their mind and in their heart in their heart of how great God is. Picture that John the Baptist has a witness from the Lord himself saying that among those born of women, there is none greater than John the Baptist. So you can imagine that the standard or the the place John the Baptist holds in God's eyes and in the society at the time was huge. People looked at him, either feared him or went to him for advice or despised him because they were envious of how he was bold and strong. And yet when they came to, they disputed among themselves about purification and theological issues and who is what and how much is who and all this. They came to him and said, Rabbi, they were calling him teacher, Rabbi, the one that you were, you know, was telling us about now, people are following him. People were following you by the droves, now they're following him. What's happening? And John the Baptist's response was, no man can receive anything unless it were given to him from above. So John the Baptist, by stating this, was giving us his way of telling us how great is our God. That's what he was trying to do. He trying to say, your God is so great. But if your perception of him isn't, it'll be very difficult for you to see that or realize it. And of course, if it's hard to realize it and see it and feel it in your heart, how much harder will it be to witness to that when someone asks you the reason for your faith and why you believe the things you believe? It's a very serious question. I'm not sure if you, you're, you're feeling what I'm feeling about this question, but it's a huge question. How great is your God? If someone comes up to you and says, how great is your God? For one religion to say, God is great. Another religion, there's no greater than God. We even say it in the liturgy. Oh God the great, the eternal. God is not after titles from us. He's not looking for titles. He's asking you in your heart right now today, what am I to you? How great am I to you? Am I great at all? Just like he asked the disciples, you remember, he had told the disciples, who do men say that I am? And when they gave him their answer, he said, well, who do you say that I am? Because at the end of the day, that's what's going to matter. It doesn't matter what so-and-so says, so-and-so thinks, what YouTube says, what TikTok says, what Google says, all these things, they don't matter. At the end of the day, who is he to you? How great is he to you? Or how not great is he to you? This is a serious question. So it needs to be answered. And they say, well, the world has given us answers all the time. The world, when I say the world, I'm not just saying the opinion of men. I'm saying just nature around us. Even the Psalms that we, we read and the Psalms of today, it says, I will also meditate on all your work and talk of your deeds. So for David or the Psalmist to say this, that means these deeds must be very great. Your way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Who is so great a God as our God? So can you see right away there's that question that comes from deep within, from a very firm conviction. It says the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. The skies declare the glory of His work. But John the Baptist, when stating that verse, when he said a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven, he wasn't just focusing on the creation and how great it is. The beauty of the sunrise, the beauty of the sunset, the beauty of a flower, the beautiful of a newborn baby. This is all true and great and beautiful. But he was focusing on him. He who did these things. He who put all this together. And not only he who put all these things together, but what is he to me? I mean, John the Baptist had to be speaking from a heart that knows who his God is. I hope that my message is not confusing.
But I really pray that you and I will really pray together today and ask ourselves and pray and so, Lord, open my eyes. Look, there's a beautiful song that says, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. It says in the book of Psalms, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Enlighten my eyes, let me see. If only our spiritual senses were sharper, there are many things that go by us completely unnoticed, even in the middle of liturgy, even in the middle of the offering of the body and blood of our Savior. There are many things that would be very powerfully clear to us, that would change our perception completely. So John the Baptist knew this. And you say, well, John the Baptist had a bird's eye view of things or had a very particular or unique view of what was happening. I say, yes, that's true. But he also had a will for that perception. He also had a desire for it. He also was seeking it. Are you and I seeking it? Truly? I mean, we all come down the communion line, receive communion. What are we looking for? Or what are we seeking? Or who are we receiving? Or is it just what are we receiving? Are you receiving someone or something? All these things are questions to consider with me today. He goes, and, and of course, you'll say, as we were saying, John the Baptist witnessed certain things that were incredible. He saw the Holy Spirit descend like a dove on the Lord. He heard the voice of the Father. He saw his Lord coming towards him for baptism. He saw, heard, and witnessed all of these things. But his testimony was before that. Don't think that this is the only time John the Baptist notices or sees these things. His witness to this great majesty, this excellence, was before even that moment. He knew, and he seeked, and he found. The disciples had that opportunity. And you and I have that opportunity every single day of our lives. When you wake up in the morning, take a moment before you rush out of your room or before you get to the phone. Like as soon as you stop your alarm, snooze your alarm, whatever it is you're going to do, pause for a second. Take a deep breath. Do the sign of the cross and say, how great are you, oh my God. Grant that every moment of today I can witness to this greatness, to, to see it happening. Because the greater He is in your heart from the moment you wake up in the morning, the more you will notice that in your day to day, and the more you will witness to that in your day to day. The more people around you are going to feel there's something about you different because you're not living at a, only the natural man's standard, you're living at a higher standard. You have a greater standard of holiness that you are seeking. You remember this scene? This is in the book of Acts. At the ascension of our Lord. It says, the disciples were looking in awe, steadfastly. It says, and while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as you went up, behold, two men, angels, stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So this is the last vision they saw. Or at least we can say at that moment. The last time they saw this, they witnessed this glory. They were witnesses to it. And that's why they were able to go all the way till martyrdom for this witness. Say, well, I didn't get to see what the disciples saw. My answer to that is seek in your heart. Don't wait for signs from heaven. Because the second coming is going to happen sooner or later. Whether in our lifetime or in another lifetime. But we do need to wait to the moment where we see God coming on the clouds to say, Oh, how great is our God. Start from today. Ask Him to open your eyes. I promise you, there are many things that we are not perceiving that we will begin to perceive. In a totally different way. It starts in the heart. St. Isaac tells us the mysteries of God are not learned through pen and ink. So it's not by reading and studying and memorizing. But only if they are sown by God in the heart. God has put in our hearts eternity. Solomon says he has put eternity into our hearts. 
the Holy Spirit who has been given to us enables us to see and witness. It's only through the Holy Spirit anyway. It's all meant to lead us back to that. St. Gregory says nothing that has come into existence without God so that the marvel of everything that comes into being might lead us back to Him who made it. Again, so that as we witness, we see who designed this. How great is our God? Who said this? How great is our God? Who did this? How great is our God? Again, leading us to what St. John the Baptist witnessed. He witnessed Him. He was testifying to Him. He was testifying to who Jesus is. I am asking you to pray with me today that you and I can begin to testify to who Jesus is. Not just what God has done. Because this is where St. Peter tells us, sanctify the Lord in your heart. Always be ready to give a defense for the faith that is in you. For the reason of that faith. Why do you believe in this? You're not going to explain it by using theological terms, especially with a person that is not even interested in theology. A person that is just interested in debating on a general level. But when you bring them to a personal level of who God is to you, that no one can receive anything unless it was given to Him from above, then it's a personal matter for you. It becomes much harder to argue it with you, to debate it against you. St. Paul was telling us this today. It says, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest. How do we enter the holiest? By the blood of Jesus. We enter the, because of this blood, we enter into this holiest. By a new living way, which was, he consecrated for us. He gave it to us. That is through his flesh. He says, draw near with a true heart. Draw near in sincerity. Draw near with everything you have in your heart. And say, here is my heart. I ask you to take it and Mold it, shape it, reveal into it. Reveal your most Holy Spirit in my heart. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. This is what we received in baptism. So the church has been celebrating this and speaking of this over the past few weeks. St. Peter gave us a very interesting indication to this. Because he personally had some very special moments Regarding this with his Lord. It says here this question. So if you want to be able to ask yourself and answer how great is God to you. The question that is directly linked to it is him asking you, do you love me? Jesus is asking you this morning. You remember this context? I'm sure you do. When did this happen? This is after the resurrection. This is after St. Peter denied the Lord three times. The, the Lord when he came to them at the shore of the sea, of the lake, and prepared fish and bread for them for breakfast, and they saw him. St. John said, is the Lord. St. Peter jumped in and started swimming aggressively to get to the shore. And he got to the Lord. And he said to him, who spoke first? Who said this question? A hint, it's in red. Usually in the New Testament, the words in red are the words of Jesus himself. The Lord is the one who initiated the conversation. He asked St. Peter, do you love me? He didn't think to ask him, or we don't see him asking him, how could you do this to me? How did you deny me? How could you think this? How could you not do this? How can I trust you again to serve me? And all these thoughts that come to the mind that the demonic plots are thrown at us to make us doubt in ourselves and walk away like many have done. He says, no, 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 none of this. He says, do you love me? He didn't think to even say, do you, do you think I love you? Do you think I still love you after what you've done to me? Had nothing to do with the love of God because the love of God does not change. There is no variation or shadow of turning with him. He asked him, do you love me? Because I love you. But he didn't need to say that because it was clear through how he was looking at him. You can imagine that every time the Lord Jesus looked at St. Peter, whether it was when he denied him, whether as we, he was about to drown in the sea during the storm, whether any moment he asked critical questions, at every moment the, eye, the fixed eyes of the Lord Jesus on him were, I love you. This, this is what he was always saying, constantly saying, I love you. So he didn't ask him, do you think I love you? Or don't worry, I still love you. That was not a, a point to discuss, even to bring up. There was no need to bring this up. He says, the, the important thing is, do you love me? 
Because if you love me, you'll be able to testify to the greatness of my love for you and every single human being that comes into this world. That's how it works. So if you want to be able to answer the question of how great is our God, ask yourself of your love for Him. Say, well, I don't know if I love Him. I'm not sure if I love Him or how much I love Him. I have doubts. I don't know. Then I'll take you a step back and just say, Lord, reveal your love for me. Reveal to me how much you love me. Because St. John tells us we love Him because He first loved us. That's how it all begins. It's because He loves us that we began to know love. Because He is love. If we think we, anyone in this world thinks they know love outside of Jesus, they are far, far away from reality. Think of it. People can get married. They stand at, before the altar. They put wedding bands on. They kiss. They dress up. They do a huge wedding day. And they profess that they love each other. And maybe within hours, weeks, days, months, they may get to the point of not only not even, not even saying I love you anymore, but hating each other, divorcing each other, cheating on each other. And the list goes on. So anything outside of the realm of the love of Jesus is far from true love. It's just human weak love. It's very weak. It's very uh, fluctuating. It's very conditional. But when it's anchored in Jesus, you will love a person to death. You will die for your wife. You will die for your husband. You will die for your children. You will die for your enemy. Because that's what the Lord Jesus did and manifested to us on the cross. This is where it is. So I ask you to ask for this critically. How great is your God to you? Who is your God to you? How much do you love Him? And if you're not sure of all of these questions, begin to say, Lord, reveal your love to me. Grant me to know your love for me. This will do wonders to answer this question for yourself and for everyone around you. And sometimes not even by anything you might say. It will just be manifested by what you do and who you are. Much less by what we say. The tongues of men and of angels do nothing, right? As, as, the, as the, the words of St. Paul say. So you remember the moment, just to wrap up, you remember the moment where St. Peter preached. A simple fisherman stands in front of thousands, preaches a word, and thousands come to Christ. And the word was anointed by the Holy Spirit. And that's why it, it brought these souls to Christ. And he said to them, repent. They asked him, what was, must we do? He, they sa he said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll, you shall receive this great God in you. So, so what will I do once I've received? Again, this is where we begin to manifest theory into reality. Theory into practice. Okay, now I've been baptized. I've received the Holy Spirit. Now what? What will I do? St. Peter goes on to say, For the promise is to you and to your children. The promise of eternal life. To you and to your children. To all who are afar off. As many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and exhorted them saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. And those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. He said, Be saved from perversity. From crookedness. Live in and by integrity. Whether everyone's looking, whether no one is looking, whether you're talking to a hundred people, a million people, talking to yourself in the mirror, make sure the message is the same. Make sure the message is the same. So they continued. They received, they were baptized, and they continued. They, they believed and received. They were baptized, they continued steadfastly. In the faith of the church, in the theology of the church, the, the sound doctrine of the early church, and fellowship, and in communion, the breaking of bread, and in prayer. St. John the Baptist, when they came to him and said, what must we do? He told them, you have to bear fruits worthy of repentance. Or in another version of the same verse, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. So in other words, now that you've received, how do you prove it? What do you do? St. James says, Prove your faith by your works. 
bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. Don't say, I am of the Coptic church. I belong to such and such a parish. I am Orthodox. I am Catholic. I am this, I'm that. Because the Lord is able to make stones, make out of stones children to Abraham. So it's not my affiliation, but it's my inner life with him. St. John said to the, in this today's gospel, in that discussion, he, says, he must increase, I must decrease. If he's great to you, he will increase naturally. But if he's small to you, how will he increase? If God is a small God to me, or what he has done to me is of minimal importance, or just a theory, how can he increase in my life? How can I say these true words and live them? He must increase, I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. Makes us think, what is the language we speak with, speak of? He says, do we speak of earth or of heaven? Do we speak by earth or by heaven? The Holy Spirit that was given to us enables us to do this. If you have hope that you can be a saint, congratulations. Your hope is fulfilled. That's why he says, now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, poured is, is poured in your hearts, then you must be sanctified. You're, you're being made holy. So take this and, and let it simmer in your mind and your heart in prayer with me this morning for all of us and for all of humanity to come to this understanding of what it means that our God is great. It's not just words. Live it and believe it in your heart, knowing the love He has for you. And that will lead to your love for Him, and the actions will speak louder than the words. And glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.